Good morning. So I'm a, I'm, my name is Manu, just call, just call me Manu. I'm a professor at ETH Zurich. I don't know how many people here have heard of ETH Zurich. Uh, it's one of the top universities in the world, uh, especially in Switzerland. Uh, you might have heard of this chap called Albert Einstein. He was both a student and a professor there. And we have more than 20 Nobel laureates, and I've been there for about six years. Um, and my research looks at you know, the science of human cognition and learning. Today's talk is about one idea, productive failure. It's an idea that I, when I look back at my life, the dots come together and it makes perfect sense. But as I was living it, it was anything but. When I was in my final year of engineering school, <clears throat> you know, you had to do a, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, um, you had to do a final year project, a thesis. And I loved math, so I asked my professor, can I do a project that involves a lot of math? And he said, fine, you can do that. So he gave me a problem, a math problem, in fluid dynamics. It's a nonlinear differential equation. You have to model that. You have to solve that problem. And if you can solve that problem, he said, you will graduate uh, with honors. I said, OK. So it's a year-long project. I went back. I tried to solve it for a month or so. I tried many ideas. Nothing worked. I went back to the professor and said, hey, here's what I've tried. He said, that's good. Why don't you try X? He gave, me a, he gave me another idea. I said, oh, OK. So I went back. I tried X. X didn't work either. A month later, I go back to my professor. And he says, hey, I tried X. It just doesn't seem to work so well. Uh, I made some inroads, but not entirely. He said, OK, why don't you now try Y? He gave me another suggestion. A month later, another suggestion. So I was hitting the summer, I was six months into my project, and I hadn't made any progress at all. My scholarship was running out, and I went to the professor, look, I do need to graduate. Can you please help me? Because I'm not getting anywhere with this problem. And he said, Manu, everything that you've tried is known not to work. And I was just sat there in front of him and said, what? I've been at it for six to eight months and you've been giving me ideas that you already know do not work? Like, why would you waste my time? He says, no. Now that you know what does not work, you understand the problem in a way that you can now solve it in a way that it would work. It turned out the solution to that problem was computational, not analytical. Math only got you so far. You had to code it, do computational visualizations, and solve the problem. And true enough, in a month or so, I finished all of that up, I graduated, and the problem was solved. Looking back, at the time, I hated my professor. I hated that experience. But now looking back, I say, that was probably my first academic experience about how someone, and this is a key part of this idea, how someone intentionally, deliberately, in an evil way, <laughs> design failure so that I can understand the problem better. And if I could understand the problem better, then maybe I can solve it. Right? And that's the idea. The rest is science and what I do now for a living. The problem that I attack as a scientist and for the past 15 years is what I call the problem of initial learning. You know, learning is you know, when you first don't understand something or you're trying to learn something new, to becoming an expert is a long process. I'm just looking at the first phase. What happens when you first come to understand something new, something you did not know, a concept or an idea, a principle or a rule? What does that process look like? What does that process look like physiologically, neurally, cognitively, affectively, socially, and so on. The entire complexity of what it means to learn something. But that's the, I'm just talking, this entire talk is about that initial phase when you first come to understand something new, okay? And this is what, you know, in education, in higher education, in schools around the world, this is a daily business or a weekly business. Day in, day out, week in, week out, we are in the business of teaching people something new. So if you can understand that process a little bit better, maybe, as Tracy said, you can design for it better as well. Right, so that's the process that I look at. 
Now, in the teaching aspect, this has been studied extensively. People have gone into classrooms, classrooms taught by very good teachers, where students themselves report that they're learning very well. This is a paper back in the 80s by Alan Schoenfeld from Berkeley, your university. Um, and, you know, he went into classes, very well taught classes. You know, the pro the, the, both the teachers and the students were very good. If you would attend these classes, you said these are very well uh, run classes. But when he started to probe students' understanding about what they were learning, that's when he found that it was quite shallow. So how could it be that you go into classes that are very well taught, the students themselves feel that they're learning a lot, they're performing well on exams, in this case it was the Regents exam, which is uh, in, in New York, I think, I think. How is it that the understanding remains shallow? What is the problem, really? So I, wanna, I want to articulate the problem that I'm trying to solve or trying to investigate in my science. So the problem is not that we learn poorly from good lectures or bad lectures. The problem is that we learn poorly from very good lectures. That's the problem. Yet, day in, day out, we're in the business of giving lectures as the main way that we teach somebody something new. In the learning sciences, we call it direct instruction. Why is it that very good direct instruction remains suboptimal as a way to understand something new? If we can understand this problem, maybe we can try to solve it. So I'm going to take you through a couple of reasons, just a couple, there are many reasons, a couple of reasons why this is suboptimal. Okay? Why do we understand poorly from very good lectures? So let's try to understand why. So I'm going to do a thought experiment. A thought experiment on seeing things. Imagine you are in a movie. You're watching this really entertaining, engaging movie. Imagine the person sitting next to you is an acclaimed director. Someone who's an expert at making movies. You watch the movie, you come out of the cinema and ask you a question. Hey, did you watch this same movie as the director? And you say, oh, Manu, of course I did. I was sitting next to him or her. Of course I watched the same movie. But if I asked you this question, did you see what the director saw? Chances are you would say no. And decades of research in experts versus novices in a number of domains has a very robust and simple finding. Experts see <laughs> very different things from... Sorry, I'm hearing some echo, that's why I was... Experts see very different things from novices. Experts tend to see the same stimulus. It could be a formula, it could be a picture, a diagram, a piece of text, a piece of art, a movie, a football match. An expert would look at the same stimulus and see very different things. Experts tend to see deep structure. Novices tend to see superficial structure. But it's the deep structure that you need to be able to see so that you can understand something. And that's the paradox for a novice. If you're teaching a novice something new, they need some knowledge to, to be able to see the thing that you want to show them. But that's precisely the thing they do not have. So how do you prepare somebody to see something? So teaching is great, Explaining expert knowledge is, ex is absolutely important, but the first job of teaching is really not to teach. The first job of teaching is to prepare the novice to see. And once you've prepared the novice to see, then you can show them, then you can teach. Right? But assuming that your well-designed lecture, whether it's face-to-face -face or online, it makes total sense to you, that novices in your classroom are seeing what you're seeing in that as an expert, that assumption is flawed. So the first job, if you want to solve the problem, is to prepare the novice to see. How do you do that? Turns out failure has an important role in how you design for that, but we'll get to that. That's the first reason. Second, we also want information to be encoded, concepts and ideas, knowledge, to be encoded in ways that we can use it flexibly and adaptively. There's no point learning in a way that, oh, I, I learned to solve these kinds of problems, and if I get the same kinds of problems in the same kinds of context, and only then am I able to do them. You want to be able to 
do what Tracy called transfer. Transfer flexibly to novel situations. How is it that we develop flexible, adaptive knowledge? Again, another thought experiment, just to illustrate this point. I'm going to divide you down the middle into two, A and B. Okay? Imagine your kids who love to play with toys. Right? Just like these kids are playing with Lego blocks. I come to group A and I say, hey kids, here's a new toy. A new toy. Do you want to play with it? This is obviously a very enthusiastic <laughs> set of kids on a Monday morning in Seville. Well, let's try it one more time. Hey kids, here's a toy, new toy. You've never seen it before. You want to play with it? Yes. All right. Okay, here you go. I give you the toy. Play as you like. And I observe what you, what you do with it. Okay? Now, while they're playing, I come to this half. Remember? Hey kids, here's a new toy. Do you want to play with this? Yes. Okay, this group is a bit more enthusiastic, but they've learned a little bit. I said, wait, this is a new toy, so let me first show you how to play with this toy, okay? Let me show you. Watch and learn. I can do this, I can press a button, I can turn it upside down, blah, 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 right? Now that you've seen how, I, uh, how to play with this toy, now I give you the toy, and play as you like, by the way. You know, as you like, and I observe how you play. And I systematically observe both the groups. Which group do you think would be more inventive, more creative, with the toy. A, you know, the not so enthusiastic group. <laughs> In spite of their lack of enthusiasm, I think they would still be the more creative with it. And that's exactly what some experiments in child psychology also show. This is not just a thought experiment, these are actual experiments. It's a bit more nuanced, but the idea is very simple. What do we do with knowledge, concepts, and ideas in schools? They're not tangible toys like that. They're conceptual toys. And part of creativity, flexibility, inventive thinking, they come from being able to explore, play, tinker, fail, play, fail with these ideas. But of course, just leaving that alone is not sufficient. You need to somehow be able to do something with it. So these are the two ideas some, you know, about being able to see new things, and about being able to play with ideas in a way that helps you encode it flexibly and adaptively. And just on the basis of this, we developed the idea of productive failure. Actually, the idea came quite intuitively to me because I simply asked a very, what I would say, an intuitive question. You know, we all say we learn from errors and mistakes. We learn from failure. The question I asked was, well, if that's the case, why, do we, why don't we deliberately design for it? This is the thing that I talked about earlier. It's like that professor. Is there is an intentionality. If it's good for learning, why do we wait for it to happen? Maybe we can deliberately, intentionally design for it. Maybe we can understand the science behind it. We can understand the science of the design for productive failure as well. So both the science as well as the science of the design itself. So let me now take you through an example of what, what productive failure looks like in an actual classroom. This is data that comes from behavioral experiments that have been conducted across the world, and I'm going to show you some. Uh, actual classroom data. What do students do when they are given a toy that they've never seen and they start to play with it? So I want you to imagine you're a high school student who's learning the concept of standard deviation. It's a, it's a concept that I'm sure all of you are familiar with. It's very basic mathematics in high school. Okay? It's a measure of spread and a distribution. Now, typically, this concept would be taught when the teacher comes in and says, oh, today's a concept. Uh, today, we're going to learn about standard deviation. I'm going to explain it to you. I'm going to show you what the formula looks like. We're going to solve lots of problems, and so on. Okay? Like this group, group B. You have a new toy. I'm going to show it to you, and then you're going to play with it. In productive failure, we give them a design challenge, something that looks like this. You have three football strikers. They've scored a number of goals in the league. Your job is to decide by designing as many ways to decide who's the most consistent player, who's the most consistent striker. So if you're a kid in high school and you have not seen the concept, let alone you know, you know, done anything with it, 
What would you do? How would you try to approach this problem? What ideas might you generate? Sorry? Well, if you've not learned the concept of standard deviation, how would you even use that? That almost never happens. Because this is pre-learning of that. This is when you first come into that lesson, and so you haven't been taught the concept yet. So what would you do? Tally the figures from lowest to highest. OK, that's an intuitive way to organize the data. What else might you do? Hmm? Sorry? Ask me. <laughs> OK. All right. What else? OK, now you're behaving like kids, which is great. But one at a time. The gentleman over there. Average, yes. Averages are very intuitive as well. Yeah, I might take the average. and think. Of somebody? Ah, subtract the numbers from each other and see what pattern emerges. Excellent. Yes. Put it on a graph, look at it visually. Put it on a graph and have a look at it visually. Very good. What else might you do? Try out? What would happen next? With the data? Okay, so maybe do some prediction or, okay. There was another idea over there? Sorry? Yes, so like a tallying, but frequency tallying, which number occurs the most? Right, so excellent, good. Good sets of ideas. Do you want to see what students actually do? You have to say yes, you have no choice. <laughs> So when a speaker says something like that, you've got to jump up and say, yeah. OK, so this data comes from thousands of students, like I said, and I'm just showing you the typical solutions that they produce. So this, they use totals, and they use averages. They use medians, because they've learned, and modes, and they've learned all of that. But we've designed the problem in a way that invites that knowledge, but by keeping everything the same, they say, oops, we can't solve this problem. Okay. They start to tally the score, and they can qualitatively argue, right, you know, this one is more bunched up, this one is more clustered, so on and so forth, using very intuitive language. Some of them have learned box plots and uh, uh, polygons, frequency polygons, and they can just look at it qualitatively to get an understanding of the problem. Graphs, I think this is what you meant, you know, number of goals uh, on the y-axis, year on the x-axis, and you ask the student, what's going on here? What are you trying to see? How, how are you measuring consistency? He says, oh, if it goes up and down a lot, it's more inconsistent. If it doesn't change so much, it's more consistent. This is how they're playing with this idea, which is a good idea. But then we say, well, can you be like a mathematician? Can you be more precise? Can you quantify it? So, okay. Nobody mentioned here, but range is another very intuitive idea. They may not even call it range, but they say max, minus, minimum. Let's see the extremes. But we know they're going to use that, so we keep the same. So they look at the center, they can't find the solution. It looks the same. They look at the ends, it, they look the same. In the middle, they try some qualitative way to find the answer, but they can't. A very intuitive solution is what I call the stock market solution. This is the take differences from year to year. So how much fluctuation within each player from year to year and they add all the fluctuations. And if this number is small, it's more consistent. If this number is large, it's more inconsistent. A very intuitive solution. You will not find it in any stats textbooks that I know of, but it comes up very often. Some of them recognize the large fluctuations, positive and negative fluctuations tend to cancel out. And so we're, going, we're just going to ignore the signs, they say. Some of them go on to take an average. And so they're trying to play. They're trying to generate ideas how to measure consistency without having learnt or even know the concept, standard deviation, just yet. And this is what typically happens, but sometimes magic happens too. In this case, we pushed a group of students to quantify their graphs. And they said, OK, and this is what they came up with. They said, imagine we could hold the ends of the graph. And they said, imagine we could extend the graph into a rope. 
What if, they argued, we can calculate the length of that rope? The longer the rope, the more inconsistent. So what they've done is they've taken their knowledge of this <laughs> guy called Pythagoras, you might have heard of him, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. They've divided the graph into right angle triangles. And you can see at the bottom, they've calculated the hypotenuses 19 times to get to the length of the rope. 83.26, 56.54, and 94.54. To this date, I've never bothered to check this calculation. <laughs> Do you know why? Because the mathematics is not in the computation. The mathematics is in the play of imagination, of creativity, how you can design a situation which invites students to generate and invent knowledge without even getting it right. And that's what, that's what a well-designed initial generation and exploration phase could look like before they even learn. This is the kind of knowledge kids already have. They don't know they have it. Teachers don't think they have it. But if you can design this well, it can be really powerful. At least that's what the theory says. So, does this work? We don't know. So we do experiments. We do lots of behavioral experiments, right? And we do them in a broad stroke, experiments like that. We compare it with the most standard, regular form of instruction in the classrooms, which is, like I said, it's called direct instruction. And you can think of it as, you know, a teacher coming in and saying, here's a new toy, I'm going to show you how to play with it, I'm going to explain it to you very clearly, and we're going to solve lots of problems. And I'm going to give you feedback, very good instruction. In productive failure, think of it the, as the other way around. I'm going to give you a problem to solve first. You're going to have invent new ideas and solutions to those, to those problems. And once you've done that, knowing very well that you would not be able to come up with the correct answer, then I'm going to give you instruction. So the expert knowledge comes in, but in a, bit, in a, uh, in a while. So what do we find in experiments like that? We track three different kinds of variables. Procedural knowledge or basic knowledge. This is the kind of knowledge that comes out in your tests and exams. Conceptual understanding. Do you really understand these ideas? Or are you just, uh, you know, computationally or procedurally solving these problems? And transfer. Can you take what you've learned and try and solve a more advanced or a novel problem in a, in a completely new context? Something that you've never seen before. So when we look at measures of basic knowledge, things that come out in regular tests and exams, there's absolutely no difference in most of our studies between productive failure and direct instruction. Both methods are very good at achieving very high levels of basic knowledge very quickly. But where we start to see the effects are in terms of understanding, and the effects are fairly large, and especially their ability to transfer that to new contexts. So that flexible, adaptive encoding in other words, what you understand and what you're able to do with the knowledge that you have is path dependent. Things may look appear on one, things may look the same on one variable, but they're actually very different on some other variables that actually matter more. And these are not just my studies. A couple of years ago, with my doctoral student and now postdoc, Tan Sinha, we did a meta analysis of all such studies. I basically asked him a question, and <laughs> I said, Tanmay, let's find out, when does productive failure fail? Can we look at all the experiments that, that have been done in this genre? And let's look at what the overall effects are. And to our surprise, we found there were 166 experimental comparisons. This is um, two years ago, there are more now. And the average effect in favor of productive failure was a Hedges G of 0.34. But if you could carry out productive failure to high fidelity, then it was even higher, close to 0.6. Different fields have different benchmarks for uh, effect sizes, so let me just give you uh, first what I mean by the idea of high fidelity. Productive failure is not just about throwing somebody in, an, in the deep end and letting them figure it out, no. It's a way of designing the activity that has certain features, certain principles. We design the data the contrasts, the variance in a certain way so that it activates students' knowledge both intuitively and formally, but in a way that they will not be able to solve the problem. 
So these are sets of principles that I haven't talked about, but there are such certain principles by which we design. Then we need to design how students participate in these activities. Are they working individually? Are they working together? When are they working individually? When are they working together? And all that also is design. How, and how do you facilitate this interaction? What kinds of questions do you ask? And so on. So all that is part of the design. And all of this takes place in a social surround. You know, we are cultural beings. In fact, the unit of change is culture. You know, there are certain socio-mathematical norms, socio-disciplinary norms that are always at play. You can't do productive failure without renorming effort, without renorming failure, without renorming growth. You have to have that explicit conversation. You have to tell students, look, we're going to do this challenging activity. The idea is not for you to be able to get to the correct answer, but for you to invent, to generate, to improve upon each other's ideas, to be like Group A, kids, okay? So all of these needs to be designed. And when they're designed well, the effect sizes are very strong. So for example, if you, have, if you could represent the knowledge gain that you have with a good teacher over a year, if that gain was one unit, then what the effect sizes for productive failure are telling us, the average effect size is twice that. And if you could do it to high fidelity, it's thrice that. Okay? And that's, that's very cool. Because here we're talking about not small incremental uh, improvements, but really breakthrough phenomena. So, before I end, I want to talk a little bit about why does this happen? What are the underlying learning mechanisms? Right? And I, I'm going to put them into four A's. Right, the first A is activation. We build new knowledge based on prior knowledge. But if your prior knowledge is not sufficiently activated, you would not be able to use it to make, new, to make sense of new incoming information. So activation is key. Differentiating that knowledge is key. What the, the problem-solving part of productive failure does is to really activate your priors, both formal and informal and intuitive knowledge. Everything is activated. Now that's a resource that you can use to learn. Next, it creates an awareness. Students in productive failure classrooms are going through that experience, become aware of the limits of their own knowledge. They've tried many ideas. They, did not, they were either incorrect or did not work fully. They're aware that there's a limit. There's a boundary beyond which there's a gap. There, there's an awareness of that gap. And that gap alone is quite important. You don't come into a lecture necessarily knowing, oh, today I don't know what my gap is. No, that awareness is absolutely critical. Because it then creates an affect. It creates situational interest. Students want to know, why did my idea not work? Their motivation towards the same lecture that the teacher is going to give is different. It's not towards just attending the lecture and taking notes, but it's really trying to understand what's going on. It's also about persisting and struggling because students go and productive failure is not easy, right? You, ha you struggle and you persist through that. So it's frustrating at times. And some of our studies have shown, you know, we're used to thinking of positive emotions or positive affect states as being positive for learning always. Not true. Sometimes negative emotions, negative affect states like frustration, shame, and so on and so forth. We've done the temporal modeling of the temporal dynamics of emotions as they unfold in productive failure and found that sometimes negative emotions are positively associated with deep learning. So it's a, the situation, the affective component is huge. We're only just trying to understand. But think of the child now. His or her knowledge has been activated, prior knowledge has been activated. He or she is aware of the limits of his or her knowledge, aware that there's a gap that needs to be filled and has reached an affective state where they want to learn, they want to bridge that gap. If at that time, a teacher comes and assembles it all and puts it all together, that's what makes productive failure powerful. With that, I thank you. <laughs>